On Saturday, ProPublica published a story that struck a deep chord in readers across America. We spent months investigating Cigna and found that the health insurance giant had built a system that allowed Cigna doctors to almost instantly reject a claim without even opening the patient file. One Cigna doctor single-handedly rejected 60,000 claims in a single month. Even though health insurers reject about one in seven claims to cover treatment, patients rarely fight back. Christopher McNaughton is one of those rare few who did fight back, and he wrote a story about his battle with United Healthcare last month. The ensuing lawsuit uncovered a trove of internal documents that gave ProPublica a behind the scenes look at how United Healthcare relentlessly fought to reduce spending on his care even as profits rose to record levels. We've split today's event into two parts. The first part will feature our reporters talking about these two investigations and what they uncovered. The second part will feature outside experts who will weigh in on our findings and discuss potential changes to the health insurance industry. And now, allow me to introduce you to today's speakers. Patrick Rucker is a senior correspondent for Capital Forum, covering Wall Street, finance, and the housing industry. Maya Miller is an engagement reporter with ProPublica focused on community-sourced investigations. She's worked on stories about aggressive medical debt collection practices, toxic air pollution, and more. Ron Howergon is a former Cigna executive and current president of Fulcrum Strategies a healthcare consulting firm specializing in payer contract negotiation. Mona Shaw is the Senior Director of Policy and Strategy at Community Catalyst, an organization dedicated to building a health system rooted in race equity and health justice. Dr. David Rubin is a professor of medicine and chief of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition at the University of Chicago Medicine. And our moderator tonight is ProPublica senior editor, T. Christian Miller. Before I hand it off to T, I just wanna note that we have received more than 300 audience questions ahead of time. We won't be able to hit them all, but we're gonna try and cover as much ground as possible. And if you'd like to submit a question in today's session, you can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing it there. Thanks again for joining us. I'll let T take it from here. Hi folks, uh, I wanna repeat uh, Connor by thanking you all for showing up in the middle of busy days. Uh, this is an important topic and it's one that really has touched a lot of readers. Almost everyone has some kind of an experience with the insurance industry and many of you have probably had uh, denials uh, before when you've tried to get uh, paid for medical care. So uh, I'll be moderating today's session. Um, we're gonna start off with Patrick Rucker who is one of the reporters on the story um, Patrick, why don't you just give uh, the audience a little bit of a, a summary of what you guys found in terms of what Cigna does with its denials. Thank you. Essentially, insurance companies, private uh, insurance companies that um, handle claims and decide what care will be paid for, what care can go ahead, are left in this trusted position where they decide uh, this care will be paid for, we're going to allow this surgery, this operation or treatment to go ahead. And that process of deciding whether or not the care will be reviewed or will go ahead and how it's reviewed is unseen to the average person and, and the consumer. And so, but it, but it was a trusted relationship because the, under the law and certainly the expectation of consumers is that if they're gonna look at my uh, decision and whether or not I should, should get care, certainly they're gonna do it uh, even handedly and with like some detachment. And maybe they're even gonna look out for my best health interest as my doctor does. And I think that this story uh, raised a lot of questions about that process. Uh, the most recent story on Saturday looked at uh, how quickly medical directors, that's the name for these doctors who work for the insurance company that are hired to do these reviews, how quickly they are handling uh, the claims reviews. So whether or not something will be paid. And we found that they were often handled in less than two seconds. So that means a doctor looked at this thing, decided someone's health impacts, whether or not this was a valid, whether or not this could go ahead in less than two beats. Uh, obviously, just that fact alone just raised our eyebrows and raised a lot of questions for us. And so we were asking, how could that possibly be that anyone could make a, any kind of a meaningful determination about healthcare in that period of time? And as we dug in more, we found out that there were a handful of medical directors who were churning these things out um, in, in mass, in batches is one way to put it, 
just signing off on them uh, in, in blocks without looking at all at the at the care or the condition of the patient. And you know, we heard it from at least one former uh, insurance regulator who said that doesn't look like what I thought was happening when uh, I was regulating the healthcare industry in California. And you know, that's where we are right now in terms of what this all means. But uh, we, we, you know, we're going to do more follow-up reporting if other people believe, as many of our readers do, that that is not satisfactory. Two seconds to decide a claim. Uh, okay, well, let's dig into this a little bit more. Um, Maya, you had some specific uh, examples of what happens and how Cigna goes about uh, putting one of these um, procedures onto its list of uh, automatic denials. Do you want to tell folks about that? Yeah, so uh, during the course of our reporting, we came across this presentation that uh, a couple of Cigna employees had put together back in 2014 about autonomic nervous system testing. Um, which I'm not a doctor, so forgive me for all the doctors on the call if my language is a little murky, but um, the test is generally used to measure ner nerve damage for people with diabetes or other autoimmune diseases. Um, and what we found is that Cigna in this presentation was considering adding this um, ANS testing, um, autonomic nervous system testing, to this system in which they would kind of expedite uh, reviews so that they could go to these medical directors in batches for, uh, or go to the medical directors who could then sign off on denials in batches. Um, and Cigna, uh, according to the presentation, kind of gave two reasons for doing this. Um, one was that uh, they, they thought that for some of the diagnoses that this type of testing is not, was not found to be clinically necessary. Um, and, um, you know, we, we did some further reporting on this and we went to Cigna's current coverage policies, and we didn't include this level of detail in the story, but um, there were, uh, you know, in Cigna's coverage policy today for this um, test, you'll see that there's about five different diagnoses for which they say they will approve um, this kind of testing if you write a diagnosis to match it. Um, but um, for the other ones, they say it may be denied as um, experimental. Um, but what we learned through our reporting is that if this in you know, when this uh, test was actually added to this list, um, it and if it didn't match any of those different diagnoses, it would be slated for this um, essentially automatic denial. Um, and we we did ask a couple of folks who work on this testing, doctors who, you know, order these tests, and they said that the list of diagnoses and Cigna's coverage, current coverage policy was missing some um, you know, some important diagnoses like Parkinson's, for example, that this testing is important for. Um, so, that, so that was one reason they gave was clinical reasons. But again, we dug into that a bit more and found some issues with that. And the second reason uh, was savings, um, which I think Ron will talk about in a little bit um, more detail. But um, yeah, in the presentation, they estimated that if they added this test to the list, they could save $2.4 million a year. Um, and so that was, um, I think, the reason that the two reasons Cigna gave in this presentation for wanting to add this test to the list. Uh, let me take it to Ron now. Ron, you've been in and around this business for a very long time. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how insurance companies view the process of, of denying a claim? Is it something that saves them money? Is it something that they're uh, really wanting to do to kind of keep medicine costs uh, down? Just tell us a little bit about how insurance companies look at denials. Sure, absolutely. Well, I think it's important to understand that sort of the core function of an insurance company is to process claims, is to process those bills from your doctors, hospitals, et cetera. And their systems are designed to automatically auto adjudicate claims. They don't want people involved. So they've got these very elaborate systems that first of all determine, is it a claim that should, I should have? Is it my member? You know, is it a covered service? And they check all of these things. If the claim clears all those things, it'll automatically pay. A denial is something that has to pull that claim, if you will, out of the process to stop an approval. So the, the point I wanna make is, it's not like they're approving care. Approval is the default. The denial is the exception. And what they do is build functionality into their systems to pull things out that they want to either review, or in the case of this story in Cygnus case, auto deny, okay? And so they do that because of two things. One, as Maya just talked about, it saves millions of dollars. Secondly, it's a way for them to keep their product, if you will, from being a commodity. 
If all the insurance companies ever did was just auto adjudicate claims, they would be very similar. They'd be a commodity. So this is one of the ways they differentiate themselves from their competitors. We do this better. We save you more money. You know, we, we have a better process for looking at these things. And so it's a product differentiator. That's one of the reasons why they, they pursue denials. Huh, that's interesting. And if it's a product differentiator, uh, why don't they focus more on sort of approving uh, claims more often um, than they do? Um, I think it's a couple of reasons. One is um, the denial is where they save money. It, think of this as claims which are revenue for doctors or hospitals are expense for the insurance company or for their employers. The other is a concern about what's called adverse selection. Adverse selection is basically an insurance company getting too many people with certain disease states or chronic illnesses. I'll give you a perfect example. If you suddenly were uh, known to be the easy insurance company to get drugs for an expensive uh, condition like MS, and suddenly it came out on all the chat rooms, the internet, hey, Cigna pays for all the new MS drugs, you're going to attract more people with MS, those people you can't make money on. So that's what they call adverse selection. The flip side of that is if the if the community of, and in this case, MS, uh, people with MS say, oh, geez, don't join Cigna. It's horrible to get your meds approved and you'll never get your MRI approved. They'll gravitate to someone else. And that's an extremely profitable situation for insurance companies because they know that 5% of the population consumes 50% of all the cost. Wow, that, that's very, very interesting and a little bit uh, disheartening to hear. Um, we did a, a second story um, last month regarding the case of one particular individual, a young man named Chris McNaughton, uh, who was denied care for his uh, particular condition um, and had to fight that all the way through the court. So, um, uh, Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, that case? Yeah, Christopher McNaughton is, in, a, in a, one light, a different a uh, narrative, but getting to the same issue. And the same issue is who is gonna decide my care? Are they thinking about my best interest or what's on their mind really when they're thinking about whether or not they're gonna pay for my care? Uh, Christopher McNaughton, as you said, was a young man. He, he suddenly developed uh, ulcerative colitis, which is a, um, a, a type of an autoimmune disease, which is a class of these diseases where the body just sort of turns on itself and attacks its different systems. In this case, it was his uh, his intestines. And so he had chronic health problems that we could, you know, were just debilitating, put it mildly. Um, and it was expensive to treat. But the doctor came up with a way to, to treat it, which was a, a blend of drugs that worked in uh, together uh, to curtail his, his illness. And it was working. There wasn't any doubt that it was working. This, you know, uh, expert at, at the Mayo Clinic, one of the most esteemed uh, doctors in his field, said this is demonstrably working for this patient. And uh, in that case, United Healthcare said, "Nah, it, it was." Uh, Ron sort of got to this. It just the insurance companies and the doctor and the patient are all asking different questions. The doctor and the patient are asking, "How do I make this person well?" And the insurance company says, is there any way I can not pay or find a pretext to not pay for this person's care? And so the uh, Chris McDonald, his doctor goes to, to United and says, hey, this is working. Surely that counts for something. That's what you know, we must be after. But for United Healthcare, their question was, you know, is this under certain guidelines? Can, can it be denied? Can we uh, push this through an appeal system uh, that ended up leading to a denial? And so uh, that was just an extraordinary journey of one family that was in the 0 0.01 maybe percent of people that get denied care and fight back. Smaller number still, of course, would, would take that all the way to a federal court. Um, and so, but in the course of that work and, uh, and that persistence on the part of the family, a lot of facts and documents popped out of, out of that discovery audio recordings, video, uh, sorry, well, yes, video recordings, a, a deposition, uh, plenty of, of documents and paper. And so it was in the interest of the family, clearly, to get all this on the record and, and goes without saying, probably, it, it certainly helped a reporter uh, be able to build um, out a story based on all the facts that were on the record. And we also- and wasn't, Go ahead, sorry, Maya. Too. I was just to say, we also wanted, we had a recording actually that Connor was going to play um, that we pulled from the lawsuit during the discovery. Um, Connor, if you want to do it, it's a 
recording of a phone conversation between Chris McNaughton's, uh, a nurse at United who was reviewing um, Chris's case and Dave Opperman, who also works at United. So you'll hear Dave answering the phone and then a quick back and forth. But we just wanted to kind of, for those who haven't heard it yet, give you an insight into kind of the conversations that can happen behind these cases. Hello, this is Dave. Hi, Dave. This is Victoria. Um, sorry to bother you. I, I have some uh, updated news for you, though. Okay. Um, we did get the medical review back from the gastroenterologist, and um, he states that it's not medically necessary treatment. <laughs> yeah. I knew that was coming. I did, I did too, but I thought maybe they saw something I didn't because I'm not a doctor. So, you know. Yeah, so I think what stood out to us when we heard that, if, I don't know if you could uh, make that out, but it was uh, Dave was laughing when he heard that it was um, rejected and or that they came back and said they weren't going to approve it. And this had been medication that um, had really changed Chris's life and enabled him to you know, be an active member of society and go to school again and, you know, get off his couch and be able to, um, yeah, really interact with with people and, and be out and about. And so, um, yeah, the, the, that kind of, uh, I think that's the kind of thing we're interested in continuing and reporting on is really understanding what's behind the scenes of these denials as they take place. Right. And and Ron, why would, it, um, why would an insurance company like United Healthcare uh, suddenly change a uh, regime that had previously approved and all of a sudden say, no, Chris, this medication has worked for you, uh, but now we're going to change the rules of the game. We're going to give you a different medication or try you on, on a different treatment or deny your treatment. What's in that for the insurance companies? Well, first of all, this is one of the more frustrating things for physicians, especially with difficult patients like this, to get a patient on something that's working and then have an insurance company say, oh, we, we're not going to approve that. Um, we're going to do something else. The economic incentives are obvious. I mean, there's the first incentive that a lot of these, especially with difficult patients, um, like the one in the story, they're very expensive treatments. You know, this is not aspirin. This is not a statin that they can get for a buck a pill. These are expensive treatments. And so the easiest or most obvious economic is you don't pay that claim and you avoid an expense. Um, there's also an incentive of part of what they're selling to their self-funded employer groups is this concept of medical management. We're looking out for your money. We have this responsibility to look at your expense item. Um, and so they're showing these employers that look what we're doing for you. There was this expensive treatment that we denied. And then the last one is what I talked about earlier is the last thing that any insurance company wants to do is attract a whole lot more patients like Chris, who are very difficult, who are going to have ongoing clinical needs, et cetera. And so if you're the sort of the pushover insurance company that always pays this stuff, you know, more people that have conditions like Chris's are going to then flock to that insurance company. And that's, um, they call that the death spiral. And that's a quick way to have your stock price go down and your earnings drop. Wow. I know insurance companies worry about their own death spiral. That's a real insight. Um, Maya, do you want to um, talk about uh, the, the call outs we've made? Because it's for those of you who are in the audience, uh, ProPublica really likes to reach out to its uh, community and its audience to help us tell these stories. And often the, the best information we get is from folks like you reaching out to us to tell, give us the uh, insider's view of what's happening. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, and thank you all for coming and for all for all of you who have already written into us. Thank you so much. We've been reading everything that you've been writing in, and it's been really helpful in guiding our reporting. Um, Chris's Chris McNaughton's case actually came in through a tip. Um, we put out a call out that Connor just dropped in the chat. If you haven't seen yet, um, I'd encourage you to open it. Um, and his lawyer had actually saw that we had put that out there and encouraged Chris to reach out to us. And that's really what enabled us to get this information out there more uh, publicly for people to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And so, yeah, if you have a minute now or uh, later today, or if you know somebody who has worked in insurance um, or is currently working in insurance, um, you know, please feel free to send them the link. And um, we read everything that comes in. Um, and it helps guide our reporting. And you might hear from uh, me, Patrick, or our colleague, David, as well, um, you know, if, if you all write something in. Yeah, it, a lot of our stories do come from just uh, those kind of tips and write-ins. And 
uh, it, it, one of their jobs as a reporter is to kind of try to find out what's happening. And that's made much easier if we're talking to people who've actually lived and gone through that experience. So um, I do encourage folks to fill out that form. Um, Ron, going back to you. So I get my denial uh, from the insurance company. What is the best way to go about appealing uh, that denial? Well, it's really two things. First of all, read the denial very carefully. This is a, a communication that's going to be written by insurance company lawyers um, for obvious reasons, and it's not going to be really easy to read, but you need to read it thoroughly. In that denial, we'll talk about your appeal rights, how to appeal, and what time frame you have to appeal, what information that needs to be provided. You need to follow those steps um, and follow them very detail-oriented. The last thing you want to do is miss one of those steps and give them another reason not to want to hear your appeal. So again, read the denial and then follow the steps and try to do it quickly and thoroughly. Make sure all your T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Uh, and is there any kind of a, a time limit or statute of limitations on filing an appeal? There is, but it's very specific to what state you're in, who mm -hmm. your employer is, whether that's fully insured or self-insured, whether it's covered by federal. Um, and that's why I say there isn't a universal where you must do this with an X it will be in the denial. They have to give you that information, the denial, they have to give you those time frames. So follow that. Don't trust that your, you know, your neighbor said, oh, well, I had 90 days to appeal mine. You may only have 60, depending on either because of a different employer, or different state, et cetera. So look at that denial and follow that statute of limitations, if you will, that's in that denial. Right. So uh, Maya, if you are a person who's been denied, uh, is there anything you can do to find out more information about the reasoning behind it or what the insurance company is, is saying and is their reason is for if, issuing you a denial? Yeah, so um, there's a law that generally applies to all health insurance plans, and we'll be sure to send this out um, in the follow-up email to the event. Um, but if you have been denied, um, you can actually requ request your claim file from the insurance company. Um, and we'll be uh, writing to folks more about this um, in the next couple of weeks as well as we keep reporting on it. But um, you can see the documents, the, the notes, um, other things that the insurance plan has written up about your uh your claim um, and why it was denied. And this can be, you know, from lawyers that um, I've spoken to, they said this can be really helpful information as patients are trying to appeal the denial. Um, it also provides some good insight into what's actually happening behind the scenes and what people are saying about why your claim is denied and what process it went through. Yeah. Um, and, and we really encourage folks uh, to kind of share with us that information because it's, again, the only way we have to kind of get behind the scenes. Um, we respect your privacy. Uh, we're not going to be putting anything out on the internet or anything like that. Uh, but we, those documents really help reporters uh, as well as other people in terms of finding out what is going on. Like why is this insurance company issuing these denials? So uh, reporters always like documents. So those are the kind of documents that we would really uh, help us along in our trying to uncover the inside story of the insurance industry. Um, and on that note, Patrick, like it is very difficult uh, as a reporter to kind of penetrate this veil of secrecy and, and, and um, that surrounds the functioning of insurance companies and what they do and don't do. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that and how you, as a reporter, how did you guys uh, report out the story? Yeah, I, I, suffice to say there's, and it's hard, this is, despite the corporate bottom line profit seeking element to this, this is at the end of the day, people's health and well-being that's on the line. And the idea that a company would be monkeying around with the, the rules of the care in a way that could lead to harm did not sit well with, with a lot of people that are in this, in this business. And so we spent a lot of time trying to track them down and, and, and see if they were willing to talk to us, share the insights they had. Um, People move in and out of this space as well, like physicians that had been in a clinical setting, then maybe spend a little bit of time reviewing claims, find they don't like that. And they want to get out of that business and do something else. Uh, so there's enough people that have, you know, varying degrees of expertise or have some contact with uh, the system. Um, it's just too vast a system not to have people come in and out of it that we that we track down. Right. Um... And, and Ron, uh, we have a question from our audience here. Um, if you wanted to make a complaint about the specific medical director who uh, signed off on your denial, if that information is provided, 
can you make a complaint against that medical director who is a doctor um, often in, in a state where they are licensed? Um, sort of. Uh, it, most people, when they think about a complaint against a doctor, you know, they think of either complaining to the medical board, which you can, um, or complaint being a, a suit of malpractice. Um, the medical directors for insurance companies are almost universally immune from this concept of malpractice. Uh, mm -hmm. And their defense to that is, we're not saying what care you can have or should have, we're just saying whether or not we're going to pay for it. So it's that wonderful get out of jail free card. Oh no, I didn't say you couldn't have that test. I'm just saying we're not gonna pay for it. Um, but yeah, you can file a complaint to the medical boards. I'm not aware of any situation where um, an insurance company medical director had any sanctions or lost their license from the medical board because of their work um, involved with an insurance company. Hmm. Um, and, and just in general, who is responsible for re regulating insurance companies? Can you give us a little bit of an overview there of if, if I'm somebody who's upset about the story or who's concerned about my own uh, denial, who do I go to to, uh, to file a complaint normally? Who oversees the insurance companies? Well, the insurance companies are really oversought in, in two different ways. One, they're, they're over, there's oversight by the state department of insurance. Every state has uh, that function, whether it's state department of insurance, department of corporation, something like that. But what people need to understand is they really only have purview over what the insurance companies call fully insured, which is usually small employer group. For most of the companies like Signet and United, et cetera, that's about a third of all the people they cover. The other two thirds are covered by a self-insured or an ERISA plan. That doesn't fall largely under the state regulation. That falls under federal ERISA leg legislation. So a lot of people get frustrated because they say, well, I, my state has a law that says you have to do X. Well, that may not apply to you if you work for a large self-funded employer. So that's one of the other difficulties is finding out who the regulator is and who you can complain to. Hmm. And, and is there anywhere you can go to look up an insurance company's denial rates? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, a lot of the internal workings are considered by the insurance companies to be proprietary and confidential, trade secrets, et cetera. So very little of that data um, of their internal workings ever gets reported either to state department of insurance or to the federal government. So it really is an, an industry that um, has some regulation, but it's sort of limited in what they can actually do. Yeah, I mean, it, it has some regulation and very limited in what they do. And, and most people understand they're also exempted from almost every bit of antitrust law. Insurance companies a long time ago got exempted from Sherman Antitrust Act. So they can't even really be brought up on collusion or, or uh, antitrust violations. And, and Patrick, you've done some of this work in terms of are the insurance companies getting bigger and bigger? Yeah, they. I mean... You can see, I'm sure a lot of consumers have seen this themselves. It's, you know, who is selling the drug? Who is uh, controlling the, the insurance policy? Who is doing the review? Um, that's more and more becoming the same organization, might be different names. But Cigna, for instance, uh, owns uh, prescription distribu distribution systems, as well as even medical review systems overview, their, their claims overview claims for other companies. Uh, you know, the economies of scale apply to this as well as anything. And unless something stands in the way, they're going to, meaning a lawmaker or, or law or, or court or something, there's always an impulse to try to get as much under the, the same umbrella as they can. So they can basically kind of just grow and grow and get bigger and bigger and they've got no worries. The Federal Trade Commission, of course, has uh, in Justice Department, antitrust, uh, Ron's remarks notwithstanding, that's of course true, but the um, Mergers do still have to, and some have been either the companies walk away due to exhaustion and their courts tell them they can't do it. Um, so there are some checks there, but just look in the last 10 years of concentration, I don't think anyone would say there's very much standing in the way of these companies controlling more parts of the, the medical apparatus. And, and Maya, I had another question for you before we move on to our other speakers. Um, just give us a flavor of some of the things that we've heard from folks writing in. Like, what is their, what are their concerns? What are the most common things that we're hearing? Yeah, so we've been hearing, uh, you know, for six, seven months now um, about a host of issues surrounding denials. Um, we've heard some themes, uh, for example, imaging and scans seems to be something that a lot of people experience denials in. So we've heard, you know, specific categories of types of 
um, claims that get denied often. Um, we've seen kind of the fallout that it has had, um, both, you know, for people's physical health, but also the mental health exhaustion of having to, um, you know, battle your insurer day in, day out to um, get treatment for yourself that your healthcare provider is saying is um, necessary and that you feel is important. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about just being on the phone for hours and hours and um, some people aren't even able to do that. So they have to give up and just go without that treatment that they think will be helpful. Um, and then, yeah, since we've published, uh, you know, this Cigna story on Saturday, we've heard a lot of people uh, asking questions and I'm seeing them in the Q&A as well of, you know, is this legal? Like, you know, what's what's going on here? Um, like, how, how can this uh, be allowed to happen? And so, um, you know, those are questions that we're posing to regulators and lawmakers right now as well. Uh, but um, yeah, I think this is, you know, we're eager to continue reporting and really uh, going behind the scenes of what's happening um, when, when these claims are denied so we can uh, try to answer some of those questions and be responsive to what uh, folks are telling us. And if I could just say one thing, I mean, for those who are listening, we are still doing a lot of reporting and want to hear from insiders, people that have sat in front of stacks of paper that have these claims denials have said in on meetings where things were said that were disquieting or that you know didn't sit well, frankly. Uh, we are all ears and we want to hear uh, from people who have, have been inside where these decisions get made. Yeah, this, these stories have struck a chord, I think, in, in part because so many people are just so frustrated uh, with the industry and what they're seeing. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of satisfied customers out there, obviously, uh, but um, from the, the the tweets and the messages and everything I've, I've gotten that, that we've gotten, this story has um, really had a lot of pickup. And I think that's an indication of um, how much uh, people are always fighting and, and getting frustrated by what's happening in terms of their, their health care. And the insurance company is paying for their health care. Uh, so I think now that we'll move on to our uh, other guests. Um, uh, I believe Connor is going to give us some introductions and then we'll move on from them. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick and Maya. Uh, for the reporting you guys did and for talking to us about it. Yeah, we'd like to welcome back um, Mona Shaw and Dr. David Rubin. Um, and just to reintroduce them really quick, Mona Shaw is the Senior Director of Policy and Strategy at Community Catalyst. It's an organization dedicated to building a health system rooted in race equity and health justice. And Dr. David Rubin is a professor of medicine and chief of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition at the University of Chicago Medicine. Thanks, guys, for appearing uh, here with us to discuss this issue. Um, Ron, I'd like to ask you a, a, a kickoff question because we're going to be talking now about uh, a little bit more about um, what you can do to uh, to get an appeal and get your health care that you've paid for. Um, approved by your health insurance company. So when we're talking about medical necessity, uh, Ron, who determines what is medically necessary and not medically not medically necessary? Who actually makes that determination? Is that something the federal government sets out as a local state ordinance? Is it something insurance companies determine? Like who makes the decision? Well, there's really two parts to that. So first of all, every state has a in their laws, in their regulations, a definition of medical necessity. And every state that I've ever seen, that definition includes something to the effect of within generally accepted standards of medical care in the community. That's a fairly common standard. There's been some federal lawsuits, et cetera, where there, the one in 1990 in Florida, where all the insurance companies at a federal level for the ERISA plans agreed to a common definition of medical necessity. The problem isn't with the definition of medical necessity. The problem with who decides what is within that common medical community practice. And that's where we get to the insurance companies and their medical directors who have an incredible amount of latitude to determine that this is not within community standards. And one of the real problems for that and problems for physicians, and I know Dr. Rubin probably sees this all the time, is one carrier would say this is not within community standards. Another carrier would say it is. And Medicare might say something completely different. And so the physicians who are practicing really have this horrible time 
of trying to guess when something is going to be covered because they really don't know because someone somewhere else is going to decide for them. If, if I could add to that. Yeah, um, that's a perfect segue to Dr. Yeah, Rubin. Dr. Rubin. I appreciate it. So first of all, let me thank ProPublica and my colleagues who are appearing to discuss this today, but also all the listeners and viewers who are putting in the questions that I was scanning before I had the opportunity to speak. My specialty is actually inflammatory bowel disease. So the story that ProPublica broke on um, Chris and his experience with ulcerative colitis is relevant to something that my team and I and my colleagues around the world and specifically in the United States deal with all the time. But relevant to the question asked here, one of the challenges we face is that um, the liability for care of patients falls to the provider, the physician or the expert nurse or whomever is delivering care. Insurance companies are indemnified from bad outcomes in many cases because they'll say, we didn't say you can't get the test or the treatment. We just said we're not going to pay for it. And that's a problem because we all know that most of the things we'd like to have our patients receive are unaffordable for any normal person. So for all intents and purposes, they are in fact denying access to things that people need to have an appropriate diagnosis or management of a complex condition. So my comment here about that goes to the issue of what standard of care. And one of the denial claims that often comes across our desks, and I'm sure many people who are viewing this and others will relate to, is when they call something experimental, or they say that you have to do something else before you can be considered for this particular test or treatment, uh, the so-called step therapy or step approach to management. And these things lead to uh, consequences. And so I've been public in over the years about this, I think that uh, insurance companies recognizing their conflicts of interest regarding fiduciary responsibility to, to their shareholders and their other challenges of literally delivering care to the greatest number in the way that they can, can actually still be cost effective if they incorporate standard of practice, if they look for outcomes that are measurable that will save them money, and if they actually use some of the profits that they continue to make on a quarterly basis by dialing up the cost of premiums to invest in actually learning what the uh, standard of practice should be and the ways to measure effective care and know how to do this properly. And I've said that many times, and I believe that there is a way forward, even recognizing their conflicts. And the only other point I'll make without um, belaboring this is that we haven't talked yet about the pharmaceutical companies and the costs of therapies, which continue to go up um, dramatically, even old treatments that have been around for many, many years, and the costs go up because they can. And then what happens is people charge more because they only get a percentage of it. And it's a completely broken system that we all acknowledge. And so I'm hopeful that ProPublica will also turn their eye to some of the costs for these therapies as well, and some of the challenges that we've faced because they've been priced out of range for most of us, including insurance companies. We'll, we'll take that as a tip. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mona, uh, so you're in the policy realm. What kind of things can we do? I mean, what, first of all, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the protections that consumers have now, and then maybe you can talk to us about what are the, some of the things that are on the table that can improve um, the regulation of insurance companies? Uh, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, just to put this a little bit in context, and I think some of the previous panelists mentioned this, um, you know, just earlier this year, Kaiser Family Foundation actually looked at a lot of the healthcare.gov marketplace plans um, and looked at the number of denials um, and found that actually consumers appealed less than two tenths of 1% um, of denied in in network claims. And so certainly one opportunity is just creating awareness um, for consumers that they have a right to actually um, file a complaint and also appeal their denial. Um, the federal government also through the Affordable Care Act, you know, established a consumer assistance program. So a lot of states have the health care advocates and um, consumer assistance um, individuals who can, you know, we talk about how overwhelming it can be, how a lot of people don't have the time and resources to fight these things. So certainly tap into that. Um, and then, you know, 
there's different avenues. So there's actually a bill that was introduced last Congress that hasn't been reintroduced this Congress yet, but mindful of certain practices, like there are certain insurance plans that when you appeal, you have to go through an arbitration process and you're not allowed to file a class action lawsuit, depending on the, the type of plan you have, or you're not allowed to um, file a lawsuit period. And so, you know, opening up some of those channels that um, individuals do have access to is really important. Um, but also, you know, if you have a private or marketplace plan, you can file a complaint with your state insurance regulatory body. Usually that's the Department of Insurance or insurance commissioners, officers, um, states that have their own state-based marketplaces. You can file a complaint directly with that state-run marketplace. Um, if you have Medicaid, you can file it um, with the state Medicaid plan. Um, and then also, you can also leverage your attorney general, um, not to go too much into the weeds, but there are a lot of federal parity laws around mental health parity. Um, and it's actually the state attorney general who's tasked with primarily enforcing that. Um, and so, you know, I just want to basically create awareness. There are a lot of different channels that individuals can use at the moment to file the complaints. The more complaints that are heard, the more likely um, there's going to be some action. And, and Mona, could you speak a little bit more about that? Like, what can I expect if I file appeal? Can I suddenly ma expect somebody to magically wave a wand and they'll pay for my care? What do I, uh, what do I look forward to when I file an appeal? So um, I think maybe Ron can speak to this a little bit more than I can because I'm, I'm focused more on the higher level policy. Um, but, you know, I will share that one of the findings that came out of this Kaiser report was that insurers do uphold the majority of these appeals. Um, they found that about 59% um of the appeals were upheld um so you know i think the next case if you are allowed to file that lawsuit is to move forward and filing that lawsuit so one lesson here might be that uh, if you have an appeal you should make it yes absolutely if i could just make a comment um I, mona those those are extremely helpful points um, in, the, in the practice of doing this, it's a war of attrition. In other words, they count on people not appealing and giving up. And I'll also say that while we're trying to appeal and while we're waiting for decisions, the patient's continuing to suffer and getting sicker and having complications that cost everyone more money if that's what they're caring about. And it's a big challenge that we face. Um, we did an analysis here of our patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis who were getting advanced therapies. And we found that the time to decision, first decision before appeal, was longer when there was going to be a denial than when it was approved. In other words, the, the negative result of saying we're not going to cover this took longer to find out while the patient was suffering. And then we had to start the appeal, which then took longer still. And so there also needs to be accountability and some um, policy as well as regulation regarding the amount of time necessary. And we found that even when there are policies that in individual insurance companies have, they don't necessarily follow them. I have a patient who got a letter that said she had 14 days to make an appeal from the date of the letter, but the letter arrived after the 14 days had passed already. And it's those types of things, those little details that get everyone caught up and then patients don't get what they need and we're continuing to struggle and fight I'm fortunate to have a great team working around me here, but my colleagues in other places don't have all those resources. And certainly the patients on the other end who are trying to make sense of these letters they get in the mail and trying to navigate our incredibly complicated and broken healthcare system don't even know where to turn. It, it's really a very difficult problem. And when you're taking care of an individual patient in an exam room and looking at that one person and trying to help them, um, you uh, realize that that without the right resources, the right physician, the right team logging in to see this discussion, you, you don't even know where to turn for most people in our country. And it's really a problem. And let me follow, follow up with you for a little bit more, um, Dr. Rubin. Uh, what does it look like from a physician's eye view when you get a denial? And especially I'm interested to hear about a, a, a term that some folks might know called peer-to-peer -peer reviews. So if you could take us to like, what does it look like to a physician? What do you guys have to do if an insurer is turning down care that you believe is medically necessary? Well, I'll start with the fact that not all denials are wrong. Okay, some denials are appropriate and they exist for a reason. So we shouldn't say that every time something's denied, it was the wrong decision. I just want to acknowledge that, that some of these are appropriate when there's something that's not necessarily indicated or there's another issue. But when you get a denial, 
um, and you appeal, it used to be that we could request a so-called peer-to-peer discussion. And the challenge to that was that we noticed over the years that the person we would have on the other end of the, of the phone was not in our specialty, let alone an expert in this particular disease. And we understand that that can happen. And most of those individuals, when you got them on the phone, were reasonable. You could discuss what your, what your expertise was and why this might be relevant. And you would finish the call and they would often say, I understand this is approved. And you'd be done. And you'd get a number and you'd be finished. Um, then what we started seeing was that the individual who would take the call would say, yes, I'm a physician. I'm not in your specialty. My job is to tell you how to appeal through the usual process of writing. Um, and they have no authority to actually approve the request or the uh, appeal. Mm -hmm. So they're just there to, to satisfy some uh, policy or some status that they have that you're talking to another physician or a peer, but they had no authority to make uh, override decisions. And now most of the insurance companies that we deal with don't even allow that. You don't even have the option of speaking to someone who's a peer uh, or who's a physician or who's even at the right level to make decisions and override it because it's become so automated as you show in your recent article that you have published. Um, while you're reading the article, it's showing you how many denials are occurring by the second because uh, of how fast some of these are being turned over by Cigna and I'm sure others uh, that it just doesn't even give you the option anymore. So there's nowhere to turn except to fight back in paper and to wait and to try to figure out what else you can do for your patient who on the other end of this is suffering in some way. Um, so picking up with what Dr. Rubin just said uh, at the beginning, uh, Ron, I can see an insurance company coming back to you and saying exactly that uh, these denials are necessary. We can't approve experimental treatments. We can't approve treatments that are for uh, unapproved things. Um, how do you respond to like an insurance company which would say, uh, denials are actually an ordinary part of this process that help consume, uh, help everyone save money. They help keep uh, healthcare costs in general down. Uh, they reduce administrative fees. Uh, what's the response to that? Well, I, you know, I think much like Dr. Rubin said, every physician that I talk to understands that there are definitely in any profession, um, there are bad actors and there are definitely requests for things that truly aren't indicated. And, and whether those are because the physician doesn't understand what they're requesting or they're just trying to help their patient or whatever. So I would agree with Dr. Ruben, there are, there are appropriate denials. There are things that uh, insurance companies, employers shouldn't pay for because they don't have clinical value. I think the challenge becomes the scenario about but what, all, what about all of those denials that aren't valid in all the cases that we hear about, et cetera, and the fact that then there's a patient suffering because they're not getting what they need. Um, that's where the real challenge is. And most of the physicians that I talk to aren't really, don't have a problem with the insurance company doing that review. They just want the review to be logical, fact-based, based on clinical data. And for those things that don't fit the obvious, this is the clinical approach, this is the right approach, having that peer-to-peer -peer discussion with somebody who can, who can say, you know, the Dr. Rubin would say, this is what I'm seeing, this is why I did this, now tell me why you think that isn't the right thing to do. Uh, almost every physician that I work with or talk to almost yearns for that. They want to be better. If they're doing something that isn't the best approach clinically, they wanna know about it, they wanna get that next study. That's where it comes, they just don't have that opportunity. And they view it as, and I think rightfully so, as just a monetary denial, not a true what's mm -hmm. best for the patient denial. You know, it's a fallacy wow. that they're saving money. Um, if they actually looked at the downstream costs of some of these denials, um, where there's a delay in care or there's an adverse outcome because of a treatment that's been withheld, or you look at indirect costs, which are never calculated by the insurance companies of absenteeism or inability to go to work and then dealing with the illness and time at the doctor, et cetera, all those things add up in different ways. But for the most part in the US, they've calculated that many people will move on to another insurance company or go on public aid before they'll actually need to file those complex downstream costs. Um, I would add one more point to the list of what we want, which is a timely decision. Uh, we don't wanna be waiting and waiting. And I would suggest, and I've said this publicly, that insurance companies can make money and deliver better care if they translate some of their profits into um, better public uh, and customer service, and if they actually worked with experts to make sure that they're up to date 
on uh, how to do this better and to know if therapy is working or not in a timely manner so you can move on or keep it going, as well as have more transparency over why one treatment is preferred over another. Because we also know that the pharmacy benefit managers behind the scenes and the rebates that are being offered by um, the pharmaceutical companies um, end up with why certain things are considered first line or not, and not necessarily what might be best for the individual patients or this particular disease state. Uh, and it's a big challenge that we face, and we've offered many times to help with this across our specialty, and they've not taken us up on it. So you're left with companies that copy and paste policies out of one disease state into another just because the drugs are similar or don't stay up to date at all. The term experimental is used, which is wrong. It gives the wrong message to the patient, and a lot of times that's not even the right term. It's just the term they use as an excuse to deny something. And so there's all sorts of low-hanging fruit here that could improve care and the delivery of care and still make insurance companies profitable if that's where they need to be, but deliver it in a much better way. Better stewardship of resources that are currently available could easily be done if they invested properly. Interesting. Um, and Mona, can you uh, sort of pick up from there and talk about, um, in your view, like what kind of reforms do we need to make, if any, to like the Affordable Care Act or any other areas of, of medical uh, of law that governs uh, insurance, health insurance? Yeah, there's, um, you know, there's three pieces that community health is focused on right now. So the first one is um, strengthening this essential health benefits. Um, so those are 10 categories of care that were included in the Affordable Care Act um, of the buckets um, that insurers are required to cover through different types of health plans, but it affects about 50 million individuals in the United States. Um, and what we found is that um, every state has to choose a benchmark plan. So it's kind of the basic plan of everything that needs to be covered. But there are a lot of inconsistencies around this um, and the actual kind of regulations around essential health benefits hasn't been, been revisited in 13 years, you know, since the Affordable Care Act was actually passed. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence um, that there are things that are supposed to be covered. Um, a lot of attention was given recently to contraception coverage and a lot of insurance companies just denying methods of contraception that should have been covered under the preventive care bucket, for example. Um, so we're actually, you know, working with HHS at the moment to encourage them to um, reopen kind of their process for evaluating essential health benefits. Um, and ideally, we would like to both see what is considered an essential health benefit. So right now, dental care, vision care, that's not even considered an essential health benefit. Um, and then also just um, having more consistency. And, you know, we we're talking a lot today about transparency and, and data. Um, but there's a lot of denied claims, especially in the mental health and behavioral health space, or they cap, you know, the amount of visits. For example, we all know that there's a mental health crisis going on. Um, and so, you know, we just need better standardization in terms of the description of benefits for those plans. Um, and also just, you know, again, more of that data. The other piece um, is that, you know, the Affordable Care Act did actually try to have more um, reporting. So they did have some requirements around claims payment policies and practices. Um, plans were supposed to report on the data on the number of claims that are denied specifically. You know, CMS has a requirement to insurers to report the reasons for denying those claims at the plan level. Um, and then they actually gave the Secretary of HHS broad authority, kind of other information as de determined um, appropriate. But, you know, to date, um, this authority hasn't really been fully implemented. Um, and a lot of the data to answer these questions um, isn't actually collected by the plans. Um, it's not always audited. The insurers aren't um, reporting the data consistent, consistently. Um, so there is a lot of space um, and leverage really that the federal government has the authority to have right now um, that they're not necessarily doing. And then the third piece is something we're focused on. You know, Dr. Rubin, had mentioned, well, you can still get the care, um, but now you're paying for it out of pocket. And what does that lead to? That leads to medical debt. And so there is a huge medical debt crisis. A lot of that based on, you know, part of it is not having insurance or affordable insurance to begin with. And then even if you have insurance, what we're all finding out is that it can still be um, unaffordable. And so we're trying to work with the IRS um, and another agency, the um, CFBP to make some changes um, to 
bolster financial assistance policies for patients so that when they walk into a nonprofit hospital, they're more aware of their rights as patients about um, different um, avenues that could be helpful. So even if they don't have coverage or they have coverage, but that care has been denied, um, they're just other options available to them. So they're not going into medical debt, um, you know, trying to combat some of the collection practices, what can be reported um, on your credit score around medical debt. Um, so there is a lot of policy opportunity there as well. And, and can we just go back for a second to the uh, the issue of what insurance companies require to disclose? Uh, is the, uh, the agencies that are in charge of that, uh, whether it's HHS or, or whomever, um, why haven't they cracked down on, on insurance agencies to, to make them deliver more of this information that could allow more consumer awareness? That's a good question. And we're trying to figure that out. Um, you know, I think part of it is um, it's a resource, it's it's issue, um, but also it's, it's, again, the inconsistency. So kind of how are you able to, you know, capture trends and themes, um, you know, when the data isn't all presented in the same way. And so having kind of more standardized ways to collect that too. Hmm. Um, Dr. Rubin, what would you uh, tell a colleague uh, about how to prepare um, a, re a, a request for payment from an insurance company uh, in a way that would, would result in the patient not being denied uh, payment for that, that claim? Well, this comes up often, and we actually discuss this frequently uh, with our colleagues. Uh, you don't want to make simple mistakes. So first of all, if you're ordering a diagnostic test or if you're ordering a medical therapy, you should be sure to know what the appropriate indications are to document what that is in your request rather than just asking for the test and leaving things uh, out and in your notes to make sure you're adequately describing why it's indicated. Uh, that's all basic, but a lot of times it gets um, lost in translation. And then when you leave that off, it's an easy denial right out of the gate. Uh, so for example, if we're prescribing a therapy that's for moderate to severe uh, ulcerative colitis, like the story you ran about uh, poor Chris's situation, um, you want to make sure you say this patient has moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, and this is a therapy that's required uh, or needed, and these are the therapies that didn't work, and just documenting the basics. That actually deals with a lot of the easy things that insurance companies will deny out of the gate that are potentially legitimate for lack of documentation. You just don't want to be dinged on those. Um, then when it gets to more complex issues, you got to make sure that you go the extra step to say, this is indicated because an x-ray wouldn't be uh, as sensitive as an MRI, and we need the MRI because an x-ray was done two years ago and didn't show what we need, or whatever it's going to be. So you're anticipating some of those things. The extra seconds you take to document that properly will save you a lot of heartache and troubles down the, down the road when you're trying to appeal and getting into that black hole of communication. Right. Um, Ron, turning back to you. So uh, one of our um, audience members wrote in that uh, the, their spouse had got a cancer diagnosis in February and was denied and denied and denied, um, gone through a lengthy appeal process. Uh, is there a point uh, where you can seek damages from an insurance company for delaying treatment? Uh, and more broadly speaking, can a medical director um, at all be sort of directly uh, sanctioned for decisions that turn out to be wrong? So uh, first of all, I mean, it, it, these are the kind of stories that I think we all hate. I mean, you're already dealing with a cancer diagnosis and the, the worst possible time to also be dealing with these financial denials and all this care denial stuff. I mean, that's that's really uh, you know something that we all hate to see, but it happens way too often. Um, there have been situations where patients have successfully um, gone after insurance companies for these kind of denial things. I mean, the ones I'm aware of, there's one in, you know, with Blue Cross of Delaware and, and um, about denying cardiac scans. There was a case, a famous case just happened not too long ago against Aetna in California, where actually there was a medical director that was deposed and in the deposition said, oh, I don't ever look at medical records. And, you know, I just, I just signed these things. And they settled that case on the court. The problem for people, especially at the time when they're dealing with this, when they're dealing with so many other things, is it's it's sort of like that old adage of, you know, yes, you can strangle a porcupine, it just hurts like hell. Um, it's so hard. You know, these are large, massive corporations that have more lawyers than you have people 
Um, and they're very good at defending what they do. So theoretically, can you? Yes, and there have been a few successful cases. Is it really an option for sort of the average person? Not really. It, it, it really isn't. And that's one of the problems we have here. I completely agree. Uh, and I think that, it, as I said earlier, I want to say again, that uh, when they say that we're not telling you you can't get the treatment, we're just telling you we're not going to pay for it. Well, the cost of care in the U.S. essentially means that when the insurance company says no, you can't get the care. That's just the reality of what exists now in our system. And so I think it's a matter of time for someone to sort that out and take that to a higher level court to actually um, help us understand who's responsible in these situations. Uh, when you have insurance companies that are reporting literally billion dollar profits quarterly, um, despite the downturn in the economy or anything else, or the um, arrival of biosimilar therapies, which are supposed to drive down costs of care, yet we don't see changes in access or changes in premiums of the people who are getting the therapies. How can you not start to hold them more accountable? Uh, I understand the competitive marketplace of the U.S. system, but I do think that there's a way forward that can help hold people accountable and provide more people with the care they need and uh, try to address these issues. Yeah, and one one last quick point. Um, when Dr. Rubin signs something, he takes responsibility, whether that's a prescription, an order, a chart note, you know, he's signing his name either, you know, electronically or pen, and he's taking responsibility for what happens. When a medical director at an insurance company signs a denial, there's no responsibility. They can't be held responsible for it. They can't be held under malpractice. They're not going to be sued individually, et cetera. And so that's one of the problems that I have significantly in this is, you know, one of the things I like about the practice of medicine, one of the things I respect about physicians is they do take responsibility. They know that that signature means that they're going to be held responsible for it, except in this version of a medical director signing a denial, which has zero responsibility. And do you have any sense, Ron, about whether the, the practice that we outlined with Cigna is more, is more widespread in the industry? Do you have any sense of whether other insurers are kind of of denying claims really quickly without ever doing any kind of in-depth review of a patient's uh, condition or file. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, it just, it, it, the numbers don't work when you realize how many denials happen. There is absolutely no way that they employ enough or spend enough money on medical directors to actually do any sort of meaningful review on all of them. Now, and, and I will say, there are definitely medical directors doing review that actually dive deep into the into the chart notes, et cetera. Those tend to be very expensive, you know, complex cases, transplants, et cetera. So I'm not saying they never review the chart, but you can't deny that many claims in an insurance company and not do it sort of in an automated way with physicians just sort of signing at the bottom line. Um, they all have nurses that oftentimes prep these cases before the doctor even sees it. Um, and again, that's again, one of the problems I have is that doctor is signing their name, but with no responsibility. And never having actually looked through it or even know what's going on with that with that patient. So yeah, it, it happens throughout the, the industry. Cigna isn't the only one that does that. And there's been no attempt uh, so far to acknowledge expertise either. Uh, I certainly don't want to um, funnel everybody down to the level of needing experts for everything. But I would say that there are certain practitioners who know standard of practice and who have not made errors in their prescribing. And for the most part, when they ask for specific available FDA approved therapies that are on label are doing so properly and they could make this a more efficient process and eliminate some of this so that the time could be spent on the more complicated cases or the requests that are uh, not typical. Uh, and there's just been no effort to do that in any way that makes sense. It's, it's there are, you know, just to jump in, you know, again, bringing it back to the policy level, there are some states that are trying to do some interesting things. So in California, for example, about two years ago, again, mental health services tends to be one of the most frequently denied types of health care. Um, so they actually developed a law um, where insurance companies were no longer allowed to use their own internal guidelines, and they had a group of four nonprofit organizations develop um, guidelines. There's still issues. A lot of the plans aren't adhering to those guidelines, but that's one step of you know trying to bring some of these decisions um, around medical necessity and other things, um, and having plans adhere to those rather than make up their own, so to speak. And, and when are you talking there? I mean, I, that's kind of an accountability effort. Are there kind of wider efforts to bring more accountability to the whole system? 
There are, I think it's, um, you know, primarily around the, you know, I think we think the authority exists, right? But really mm -hmm. pushing um, to make sure that all of this data is being reported. Um, you know, and then also we're keeping an eye on certain court cases. Um, you know, there's one called the Tlefsky case right now in front of the Supreme Court um, that really would affect an individual's right to appeal a decision under Medicaid, which is, mm -hmm. you know, a fe federal and state funded program. Um, so there's there are a lot of different things happening, I would say, in the courts as well um, that we're keeping an eye on to make sure that people maintain that right to appeal. And I mentioned this earlier, but the more that people appeal and file complaints, the more that this information can really come to light. And then the more that the federal government really uses the authority that it has to collect all of this denial information. Hmm. Um, and uh, Dr. Rubin, right now, uh, when you go, are there any kind of regulations at all that govern, uh, that, um, govern peer to peer discussions? Like, is there any kind of uh, standards that the insurers have to meet uh, in providing a peer to peer conversation? If there are any, I don't know about them. I would say to you that I doubt there are. I've never had any uh, proactive communication from any insurance company. Uh, we just all of a sudden one day they were they weren't there anymore. You would ask for peer to peer, and they say, "Sorry, we don't offer that," and that was it. Uh, so I don't know if Mona knows more than I do, or Ron, but I am not aware of any uh, actual laws that govern that. Um, so, Ron, let me let me ask you: Do you are you aware of any kind of laws that govern any kind of part of the procedural uh, issues that insurance companies, health insurance companies, have with their patients? Like, is there anything that they have to do? to deal with a patient uh, denial? Well, they, they, as we talked about before, the appeal process, you know, you, you can send in this appeal, et cetera. But I'm not aware of any law that, that demands or, or requires a peer-to-peer a -peer review, let alone a peer-to-peer -peer review that um, for the physician would consider to be a peer, um, somebody who understands this specialty and the, the most current clinical thinking around it. Um, uh, Dr. Ruber, let me let me bring you back to a uh, issue you raised earlier about the uh, the pharmacy costs going up. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that affects um, uh, uh, approval or denial of claims? Well, obviously, if if the I don't want to oversimplify, but if therapies were um, less expensive or actually cheap, um, there wouldn't be these policies and these denials that exist to try to save money. Um, they're not. Uh, unfortunately, the primary motive of these denials and the decisions by the insurance company is to manage their finances and to balance their books, not to deliver the best care. I'm sure some in the insurance agency and industry would take issue with me saying that, but that's the way it appears to all who are dealing with this on a daily basis, and we have to acknowledge that that is real. Um, so I would just say to you that um, the cost of care is therapies have gone up in complexity and in the R&D that leads to a new treatment being approved, which we acknowledge is a big investment, um, is what's driving some of these big problems. But as I mentioned earlier, even older therapies like insulin or EpiPens or even um, some of the old-fashioned suppositories we sometimes need for our patients, none of these are new, but their costs have gone through the roof. And so have denials of basic things that we used to be able to get our patients all the time. And so there's a lot of challenges here and it's being driven by uh, profit motives, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think it's a, a supply and demand issue as much as it's about we can charge more, therefore we will. Um, so, so, so other than sort of like getting costs down, is there nothing else that we can do about insurance companies kind of acting in their economic interests uh, before a patient's interest? I think this is part of that process. I appreciate what you're doing to have this conversation. I appreciate the work that Mona's doing. I think there's a lot of people who are trying to address this. And I honestly, to be fair, I'm sure there are good people in the insurance and agencies and industry that are trying to do good things. I've had dinner and meetings and discussions and roundtables with insurance managers. Their um, concepts and their mission and their ideas of how to manage are very much different than what a physician who's at the who's at, at, on the front lines is dealing with. That doesn't mean they're all wrong, 
but it starts with this issue of even having a communication with them about how can we do things better or what would be easier for everyone involved. Um, we, there's a disconnect because they think about it very differently. They're not interested in the latest guidelines uh, necessarily. They're interested in how do we take what is a limited resource in their mind, the amount of money they have, and the amount of requests they're getting for very, very expensive therapies and try to make it uh, the end of the day to make the numbers add up. I, I get that. So there's a big um, divide between these goals. Uh, and that's a big problem that we have to continue to struggle and figure out. I, I saw multiple people in the in the comments during this program saying, um, maybe we should be reevaluating a single payer system and a different way to manage all this. This comes up, it's the perennial question, and it's worth having an ongoing conversation about it. Um, it's Probably not something that's going to happen soon, but it's certainly one way to continue discussing this issue. And Mona's nodding, so maybe she has more to say about that. Well, I just, you know, I want to add part of it, part of the challenge is the complexity of the health insurance system that we have. And so even when you talk about, you know, the different government agencies and who has the authority, you know, outside of HHS, you know, there's Department of Labor for the employer sponsored plans, there's the Treasury Department, um, you know, there's HIPAA laws, there's ERISA laws. Um, and so that almost makes it easier for, um, you know, some of these health insurance companies to do what they're doing. Um, you know, last year, there was a lot of attention that was placed on Medicare Advantage organizations and um, kind of their denial based on prior authorization. And there were a few bills that were introduced as a result of that. Um, but again, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, also to different health insurance plans. And so I think if there is a way to, you know, streamline things um, and have, the requirements honestly be the same across the board um, because right now they're not you know even with the affordable care act you know it, it applied to non-grant fathered plans marketplace plans small group insurer large group insurer you know a true policy wonk can really get into the weeds with you and i think um that's one of the biggest challenges is not you know really understanding your rights as a consumer um, because the type of insurance plan you have really matters in terms of what they have to do a lot of private payers look to the to Medicare to guide their changes in policy and coverage. And so certainly that would be a helpful place to continue focusing efforts. Uh, so we're drawing uh, close uh, to the end here. Um, as a final question, uh, a little bit of an artifice here. I like for each of you, could, could you name like one, the one most important thing that we could do to improve um, health insurance companies uh, approval rates to make sure that more people get more care paid for uh, what's the one what's one top thing we could do uh, ron i'll start with you well first of all i think i think it'd be great if we had one set of coverage policies a national set of coverage policies not decided by insurance companies decided by you know an external entity you could take a representative from every medical specialty you know the american college of cardiology etc that's the coverage policy people shouldn't get a test because they have this insurance and somebody else with the same presentation not get it so they have a different insurance. And then once you've got that one set of coverage policies, much like if you will, how we've got you know OSHA looking at workplace safety to make sure people are safe, have a government entity that oversees that. If they violate, if the insurance company violates that coverage policy, just like if an employer creates an unsafe work environment, there's penalties for it, there's consequences. To me, that would be a wonderful first step in helping solve this problem. Mona? Yeah, so, um, you know, very similar. Yeah, I had spoken earlier about the essential health benefits, um, but I really think when that's a first step when it comes to um, coverage policies and, you know, really working to make sure that those are consistent um, and that those are enforced, um, I think is really important. I will say mm -hmm. also making it easier for consumers to file those appeals and to make those complaints um, would be second on my list. Two is okay. We'll, we'll take that. And uh, Dr. Rubin, uh, one thing that we could do to really improve the delivery of uh, insurance payments to patients who need them. Well, I think the insurance companies should be required to convene uh, experts uh, periodically. I wouldn't say annually necessarily, but to make sure that they understand what the standard of practice is in the space and can update their policies appropriately. Um, I agree completely that streamlining the appeals process would be helpful. 
Um, but I think that underscoring this is the recognition that medicine is advancing and that there are things that they need to stay up to date with so that they're not behind and they're just making decisions based on cost rather than understanding how we're actually improving the care of people. So that would be my first request. And they can afford it. They can afford to do this. It's a matter of telling them that they need to and then holding them accountable. Um, well, that's our time for today. I want to thank all of our speakers, Ron, Dr. Rubin, Mona, Maya, Patrick, and our moderator, T, for sharing their insights on this important issue. A big thank you to everyone who tuned in for today's discussion and all the excellent questions you submitted. I'm sorry we couldn't address all of them, but I hope you consider subscribing to ProPublica to stay updated because we're going to keep reporting on this issue. And from all of us here, thank you for joining, and we'll see you next time. Have a good day.